So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday He is risen. Isn't that a neat little history that you know some people he is risen indeed. You know that? I mean that that Good Friday is only good because of today, because of Sunday, because he is risen and risen indeed and it changed everything. We we've been looking at Easter services all this month <laughs> because it's just it's too much this hell all at once. It's too big a story. But uh, today we get to the end, the Sunday. And, you know, we've been looking at Friday, you know, which they, they call Good Friday. And it's like so difficult. But uh, it's because of Saturday was Sabbath. That was the, it's always been the end of the week. There's never been a question that Saturday is Sabbath. It took a couple hundred years before Christians started gathering specifically on Sunday. Because before that they were gathering every day and worshiping together. But after a few hundred years, it started focusing in on Sunday. And the whole point of not doing it on Sabbath, but but taking that one day a week, and, and it was in celebration of Sunday. What happened on Sunday? Um, which rather than Sabbath being the end of the week, was the first of the week. So we'll, we'll see some of that being set up here in this scripture today. We're, we're reading in Mark which is uh, the most condensed of all the versions of the Gospels, which uh, still, it's a big story. So I'm going to start off in Mark 15, verse 42. And, and Lord, we just ask that the power of your Holy Spirit, you'd speak into our hearts and you'd help us with truth and, and uh, relativity, that that can be real to us, that it can uh, make a difference for our lives. So speak to us, we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Beginning in verse 42, it says, It was toward evening when Joseph of Arimathea arrived. He was a respected member of the council who was waiting for the coming of the kingdom of God. It was preparation day, that is, the day before Sabbath, Fridays. So Joseph went boldly into the presence of Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus had already died. He called an army officer and asked him if Jesus had been dead a long time. And after hearing the officer's report, Pilate told Joseph that he could have the body. Joseph bought a linen sheet, took the body down and wrapped it in the sheet, and placed it in a tomb which had been dug out of solid rock. Then he rolled a large stone across the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Joseph, two separate Marys, were watching and saw where the body of Jesus was placed. Now when the Sabbath was over, it begins in Mark 16, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and, and Salome, which is the same two Marys, brought, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the very first day of the week, that would be uh, the Sabbath, or, or Sunday, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away from the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. Here you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, 
he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons, and she went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven. We notice it's eleven now, minus Judas. As they were eating, he rebuked them for their lack of faith, their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written at that time specifically so that history wouldn't get changed as has happened a lot, you know, in mankind in history. You know, we retell the stories, we do this, that, and the other, and the stories change slightly. Well, they were already dealing with people saying that Jesus didn't die because the reality of him dying, everybody saw him, hundreds of people, even at one time, had seen Jesus in the, the month after he had resurrected. And so it was hard for them to refute that. So their story was that, well, he never really died. He must have just passed out. They're coming against that. The four Gospels, they give us all different facts. I mean, they don't tell a different story. They just give different facts to the story of the resurrection. And it's curious reading them all because you get so many different perspectives. But the one thing they all agree on is that Jesus died. And they put him in the ground, and then he resurrected. And that's, that's the big thing that the Gospels were written for, is to, is to keep this good news as it is and come against the teachings that the, um, the Jewish leaders were giving, that he wasn't dead. In John chapter 19, verse 31, there's another you know, element of this that says, For the day of preparation, that's Friday, preparation before on the the Sabbath the next day was to be a, this was going to be a very special Sabbath it says that's that Saturday because the Jewish leaders did not the, want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath the Jewish leaders asked Pilate to have the legs broken of the bodies of these three criminals on the cross up there and the soldiers went and they broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, there's been volumes of stuff written on this blood and water that flowed from Jesus' side, and it's you can go a lot of different directions with that. But really, medically, it's it's a it's very explainable that whether it be from hypovolemic shock or whether it be from the pleural or pericardial fusion all of those circumstances would occur when someone who's been tortured and then you know hell without why they're, they're they're going you know having gone through all that Jesus went through it causes fluid to build in the sac around the heart um, pleural fusion um, or, or pericardial fusion. Pleural fusion also causes lung to gather in the water to gather in the sac around the lungs. Both are going to be pierced if you thrust it into his side, especially from below. It went into his side, went up into his heart and chest. So this blood and water is uh, not only been prophesied, but but it was it, it's medically it's just not a shock that that's where that would be. But why? Why was Jesus pierced? You know, and, and we, uh, we see the whole element of that and because it's, it's weird. The soldiers were asked specifically, go break their legs. And Jesus is pierced with a spear. Well, we ask, well, why is that? Well, number one, we know from those who've read the scriptures that in Isaiah it was prophesied more than a thousand years before that the Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions and we see also in prophecy and in, in, in Psalms that he keeps all his bones none are broken 
Now here you have these soldiers told to go out and break their legs, which is how you rapidly accelerate a crucifixion, you know, is just break their legs because then they can't breathe. The, the whole torture of crucifixion is you're hung up, you know, by your arms and that. When you sag down, run out of strength to lift up, you can't breathe. Because for you to be able to breathe, you have to be able to lift up so your your um, diaphragm. diaphragm, thank you, <laughs> can expand so you can take a breath. And then when you fall back down, it blows all the air back out of you again. Well, that's the struggle, and that's the the horrible torture of the cross is that it's a slow death. You got to wear out. You know, Jesus, on the other hand, was had been so tortured and whipped and lost so much blood that um, he was in bad shape before they put him up there. But it's curious as uh, you know that as Pontius Pilate, you know, as as Joseph and Matthew went to him, he was shocked that. Jesus was hearing Jesus is already dead. You know, he, he says, no, he's, only, he's only been on that cross for six hours. How could he have died so quick? So he had to call in a soldier to make sure he was right. Those soldiers went to break those legs on purpose, and yet Christ was not. And it had been prophesied, and just one more of the many confirmations that God was... And on this whole thing, he planned this whole thing. Jesus came for that specific reason, to fulfill all these prophecies for us. The reality is that Romans don't make mistakes, like um, letting someone live through a crucifixion. You know, they, uh, the, for, for Roman soldiers, the penalty for not accomplishing the task for which you were set out to do, you guard, oh, you guys crucify these things. If they, if these guys didn't die on that, the penalty for those Roman soldiers would be to take that prisoner's penalty. So they would be killed. They would be crucified. So you can bet these Romans, they would not let Christ go, pass out, pull him down, let him go. It is just not possible. It wouldn't happen. But all the writers of the Gospels, they were dealing with that already. You know, the already in the communities, that was what being spread around, that, that Christ didn't die. That that's the explanation of why you guys saw him. It's because he came out of his, he, he passed out and they put him in the, in the tomb and his, his disciples came out and rolled the stone away and out he came. And we don't know where he is now because he's hiding out. And they stuck with that story for a long time. People are still taught that today. But the writers of the Gospels, they were coming against that. And we see here in these different Gospels that four people had a, a radically different approach here. Um, the disciples pretty much all ran and hid after this. They were, they were afraid. They were struggling. But uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph and, and Solomon, they went to get the body of Christ. And they went with Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, both of whom were highly respected leaders. One of the Sanhedrin, Joseph, and one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus. And we see Nicodemus having gone and seen Jesus earlier. He, he talked with him. And we see in this that not all of the religious leaders believed Christ wasn't the Messiah. Some believed he was. And we see that kind of faith right here because beyond the faith of the disciples who had been with Jesus for three years now and had seen his miracles and seen all these amazing things, these four, Mary, Mary, Joseph, and Nicodemus, they risked everything to go to Pontius Pilate and ask for the body of Christ. Joseph and Nicodemus, it was their peers who organized and had Jesus, Jesus you know, crucified and had the Romans do this. And, and they knew the lies that were already coming out, but they, I think, believed he was the Messiah. So they had a faith to put their careers at risk, 
<laughs> they're not going to be welcome. They're not going to be welcome leaders any longer. <laughs> they put their income at risk. They put their futures at risk. They put their families, lives, and security at risk because these leaders were killing people and they continued to for many years. We see that same kind of faith in Paul who was going around killing the disciples of Christ because they were following this heresy. And then, but Paul loved God as I think Joseph and Nicodemus. So that once Jesus spoke to Paul out of a bright light, that was like, what are you doing, Paul? Who, who is it? This is Jesus. He followed him from that day on. Paul later wrote to the Galatians. Paul was, God was pleased to reveal his son to me. It's just a weird comment from somebody who was going around killing Christians. And now Paul was ready to lay his life down for that from whom he was killed. So we don't know what percent of, of the religious leaders became Christians, but we know, we know three right here. And these are the religious elite. So there was, there was probably quite a few. You can visit Jerusalem today as, as I was able to just in 2020. And there's two locations that we were shown that, that they think is where the tomb was that Christ um, was actually in for a little while. One is they built a church around it. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the other is what they call the Garden Tomb. And it's, it's outside. And both are tombs, holes in the ground, empty now, and, uh, and quite, quite a lot of, you know, tourist attraction to both. And it's really irrelevant, right? Where, what, where he was, what the point is, they're both empty. <laughs> and they are, and there's no disputing that. Meaning, Jesus was crucified. He died. He was put in a sealed tomb. But he resurrected. He came back to life. The tomb couldn't hold him. He was seen by hundreds. We saw Mary first, and then two others of the disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. They turned around and went back, told everybody else, and then, then later on in the upper room, sealed with a door closed, Jesus materializes, Scripture shows. And then he talks to them about, what are you guys, why are you guys being so hard-hearted about this? I told you. <laughs> and they celebrated. But they still hit, basically, were afraid for over a month until the Holy Spirit came and the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 calls it, and, uh, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they became as bold as what Joseph of Arathia and Nick and Mary and Mary was. They became bold in their faith now, now risking their lives, willing to go out and share the good news. I tied some scriptures together that I listed in the bottom of your outline and they just they're just it's the whole gospel all at once in a little bit so I, I gave those to you if you want to look back at them later but this is how they read together Jesus said I tell you the truth everyone who sins is a slave to sin and the son sets you free you will be free indeed all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by which men we must be saved. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that here we are 2,000 years later. We are still celebrating what you did for us. Paid the price of our sins. Turning that horrible Friday into Good Friday. Celebrating because of Sunday, because of the resurrection, because you proved you were God. Death couldn't hold you. A grave could not hold you. And because of that, death will not end it for us either. For those who believe, who have chosen, thank you. Thank you that you have given us the choice to have a relationship with us, you or not. All of us must deal somehow with this bit of information, this little bit. I pray that you choose to call out to God, choose to develop a relationship with Him. He, he does all the work. He gives us his very spirit to give us that hope, the same type of hope that Nicodemus and Joseph had, willing to put everything on the line. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Sunday. We glory in you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Hallelujah, bye.